Okay, welcome everyone. I'll just read out a lesson 193. All things are lessons God would have me learn. A lesson is a miracle which God offers to me in place of thoughts I made that hurt me. What I learn of him becomes the way I am set free. And so I choose to learn his lessons and forget my own. Okay, so welcome Clive. Thank We're you. very excited to have you on this morning. You were here last week, so you got an idea of what we what we're looking for. We're just looking for everything. <laughs> Thank you, because when like I came in part way, I have no idea the kind of the context as it works in. As I was contemplating this, it kind of shows up like a recapitulation of my whole life, you know, as Carlos Castaneda would say. And uh, so when I thought, well, how do I start? I just thought I'd just share some stories from the early beginnings of me in this particular timeline and go through from there. Does that seem okay? Yeah, that's perfect, Clive. Yep. Okay. So uh, I was uh, born a long time ago. I'm 65. I uh, had a mother that was incredible who thought I could do no wrong. And I had a father who was pretty incredible, who was absolutely sure I could do no right. He would have been diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic. He had an incredible psychic ability, but once he made his mind up that the world was a certain way, there was no convincing him otherwise. And so his paranoia kind of showed up in fascinating ways. I remember telling Teddy years later that uh, he used to explain the world to me through comic strips. He would take a comic strip and he could tell me what was going on in the world based on his interpretation of a particular comic strip. Teddy was pretty impressed with that because he had shared that, I think when, he, when you were in an institution or way back when, for a period of time, you were getting lots of information through comic strips too, were you not, Teddy? Is that a yes? They did, they were very current. And yes. you, could, you could read sort of like, you know, and understand what was happening in the world based on who they were goofing on yep. and what they were saying as the goof. Yep. So, uh, so that kind of expanded the context of my daddy's craziness when uh, Teddy said he was having that comic strip experience too. So uh, uh, where do I start? Oh yeah, so I remember thinking about eight years old that either I, there was a choice to be made here that either I was crazy or my dad was crazy. And I decided my dad was crazy and I was just going to go from there. So I would, when I, when I contemplated this years later, he gave me an incredible gift of the opportunity not to kind of fall into authority. So that was a real blessing in disguise. You might say that no matter how young I was, I just, kind of didn't listen to any authority which was you know quite confrontational when you come to the course and discover that your biggest problem is an authority problem <laughs> and and uh, so that kind of evolved from there now as i say my sister decided she had the same decision she remembers making which was either he was crazy or she was crazy and she decided she was crazy and he was normal so she's been healing that ever since i uh started having light experiences probably when I was about six or seven. I would go out the back door of our house in the country and the whole, you know, my mom would tell me to take the garbage out and the whole backyard was just pure light. I didn't even know where the freaking garbage container was. And I would just stand there kind of stunned in the experience of light until it kind of sorted out and I could figure out which way was up. I, I never had the sense of being afraid of these experiences. They were just kind of intriguing. And uh, there was, I had, uh, since my mom was very British and my dad was completely German and didn't really speak English, by the time I went to uh, school in kindergarten, I had a lisp and a stutter and nobody could understand what the hell I was talking about. So that was his own experience of trying to communicate with others, which clearly, as you know, has sorted itself out since I seem to talk a lot. And 
as uh, life moved forward, the next sense of intrigue was probably, uh, I was 14, it was ninth grade. I was the head of the junior rotary and they sent me off to this weekend where it was all about creativity and inspiration. On, and so for two days, we were kind of bathed in this context of inspiration and creativity. And on the Sunday night, I went to the restroom, bathroom, went into the cubicle to sit down and have a nice gentle elimination, I thought. And I'm sitting there and this question showed up in my mind. And the question was pretty simple. It just started asking what's outside of this. And I remember thinking, well, there outside this bathroom, there's a building and the question, well, what's outside of that? And I just kept asking that question. I got outside the planet. I got outside the universe. I just kept on going. I completely had my mind blown. I went to a level of absolute knowing in the serenity and love of God. And I don't know how long I was there. It doesn't matter. It was a total and complete experience. And then I remember being pulled back in and I knew that I knew everything, that I was completely everything and I knew everything. And as I started being pulled back in, I experienced slowly losing it as I came in, click, 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 click till I just came back into my body after this profound experience. And I was just myself again, except that my mind had been blown. So I kind of stumbled out of there and, you know, you, you, again, I will refer to, you really don't have context for some of these experiences when you're younger. And uh, I just would put them on the back burner as, you know, something intriguing that had happened. I, uh, move forward. I just became a very good basketball player. I uh, come from a very small high school that was kind of the Hoosiers idea. This little school out of Norway went on to become, uh, went to the semifinals in a state championship. And the reason I tell you that because it ended up being my first out of body experience. Um, I was like a junior player on the team. We were playing in the semifinals. And the coach put me in to save the game. The pressure on me was unbelievable. There was like five minutes left in the game. You may not understand the basketball terminology, but in, a, in the end of a game, they put on a full court press and you're supposed to pass out of it. And coach told me to dribble through it. I was so freaked. I was very good at this, but I was so freaked. I popped out of my body. I ended up getting fouled like, six times in the last four minutes. I made 12 foul shots. We won the game. The problem was I wasn't in my body when all this was happening. I was at the top of the stadium looking at myself playing the basketball game. And so at the end of it, everybody's slapping me on the back and cheering me on like, what a great job you've done. The only problem was I wasn't there to do it. And I had nobody to tell anybody what had just happened without sounding like a freaking lunatic. So that one was put away in the file. And uh, I used to say, I mean, I was never raised in any sort of religious context, Christian or otherwise. I remember my coach coming to me one day and he said, what religion are you? I need to fill out these forms for the tournament. I said, I think I'm agnostic. I, I thought that was a religion. So I kind of threw that at him. He didn't know what to do with that. So I uh, graduated from high school. S Synchronicity and serendipity have been a companion of mine from a pretty early age. I used to say I didn't know what God was, but he seemed to keep showing up in my life as synchronicity and serendipity. And I would make choices based on trusting that everything would just turn out. You know, I, I remember in a ninth grade in Canada, you, you can't go to college unless you have three years of French language. I took two weeks of French language, thought this was the stupidest thing I ever took. So I signed up for the cooking class with all the girls for three years, 
which basically meant I could not go to college if I graduated high school. But I thought, you know, by the three years from now, something's going to work out. And the year I graduated, they took off that limitation that you needed French. So that's kind of an example of, you know, just kind of trusting the later outcomes, not planning for the future. And that's been true, except it keeps increasing. I, Lloyd last week was talking about as you keep surrendering to the Holy Spirit, uh, more synchronicity seems to show up. And I will tell you 100% that's been my experience on so many levels. So where are we? I left high school, went off to see the world, more serendipity, synchronicity. Uh, I remember I was in England with my cousins and when I was about 19 and I did my first LSD trip. Oh, I missed one piece that was really instrumental. About 17, I got really, really sick and I was running a lot of fevers. One of your favorite things, Teddy, fevers, I remember, right? Yeah. So I was running a lot of fevers and by the time I came out of that uh, sickness about three months later, two things happened. One was all I wanted to know about was Jesus, which was a brand new thing. And I uh, became quite rebellious in my last year of high school. And it seemed to me that everybody was just really afraid. At that point, I didn't realize I was projecting my own fear, but that comes later. It seemed like everybody was really afraid, no matter who I met. And they were all pretending to know whatever it might be that they pretended to know except nobody knew who they were. So it was completely made up out of fear and survival. And that was kind of the underlying theme. So wanted to know Jesus, wasn't directed to the Bible, started finding books on him like the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. And that was quite profound for me. And I think after I graduated, probably for about three or four years, I tried to be Jesus, which is pretty hard. You know what I mean? You, you think if you can understand him and you can be him, maybe you'll get a free pass to heaven. That's the way I came to it anyways. At 19, I did my first LSD experience with some cousins in a rundown tenement full of squatters. Um, I was somewhat afraid, but he told me that the worst trip, I mean, the longest trip would only last about 14 hours as I started to get pretty out there. I went out to the edge of the universe, came back and like three minutes had passed. And I remember yelling at him, you didn't tell me this messed up with time. Are you doing okay, Teddy? You look pretty intent there. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Just checking. Anyway, so uh, uh, I went out to the edge of the universe. I had about a three minute experience that seemed like it lasted two days. I yelled at my cousin, you didn't tell me this 14 hours was going to be eternity. And uh, I said, I don't like this. There was a guy I'd seen the day before upstairs. He looked just like Jesus to me. I said, get him down here. I need to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> so he brought him downstairs. And this little guy is about five foot four, looked just like Josh or Jesus, right? And uh, he sat on a pillow and he became Jesus to me. So for the next like 10 hours, I just got to talk to Jesus, which was pretty profound. I don't know what happened with my cousin, but he never did drugs again after that experience because I guess it was pretty profound to him too. <laughs> so that, uh, that always reminded me of something the Native Americans said in New Mexico. They said the Jesuits came here to tell us about Jesus. We take peyote and we go in our teepee and we talk to Jesus. I thought that was pretty profound. So moving along. Now we're uh, uh, 1920. Um, I started getting into breath therapies, which were pretty great. Made me really bored with drugs as soon as I disco discovered the profundity of uh, deep breathing. I started going many different places in my mind through, they called it the rebirthing breath back then. 
And the rebirthing community was the one that introduced me to the Course in Miracles. Uh, this would have been about 1981. And uh, one thing I discovered with that rebirthing breath, I mean, the purpose of the rebirthing breath was to take you back to your original birth, not original as an eternal birth, but original as in being born into this particular timeline to release the trauma of that birth. And they would give you a book called Birth Without Violence that you would look at for 10 minutes before you started the rebirthing breath and you would re-experience your birth, which I did on a number of levels. Truly, I went through my birth, released a lot. But I was shown at some level that it was really just programming from that book that was taking me into the experience of the rebirthing. So I would have about an hour and a half on a ferry ride to get to these rebirthing teachers. And I would cram a book before then, like Carlos Castaneda, or uh, something called the door of everything or the querying hospital of jesus the christ and i would cram that and then i'd go into this breath session and i'd be taken out and given the experience that the book was bringing forth and that was always so rich and so valuable to me through all of that that uh, the breath has been instrumental in many different openings for me throughout this particular timeline and moving along let me see probably about 25 now get married for the first time my wife at the time was a, a lady named Mary Johnston who ended up being in Wisconsin later on and uh, we're still very good friends we got unmarried about 29 but uh I think we were talking about cults or something last weekend. And my first cult experience was being able to, I got into Est, which many of you know about. I mean, Gary Renaud talks about his experience of it in the disappearance of the universe. Got into Est for about four years, five years. Uh, very illuminated in a lot of levels. And one of the things that dawned on me at some point that had a, it was one simple little statement that triggered a massive movement in my mind. One of the trainers came back from a retreat that he and the head of S, his name was Werner Erhard, they'd gone on. Werner had discovered the Course of Miracles. He had all the trainers read the, and study the course. I don't know to what degree, but this trainer came back and he was doing this little seminar for us and he looked completely stunned. And, and I asked, I said, what happened there? He said, I don't know, but Werner said this one statement. He said, you don't think, it thinks you, and there is no it. And when he said that to me, this whole deck of cards, just house of cards just collapsed. It was so clear that that was exactly what was going in. Something triggered from the Course in Miracles. I mean, if you take the lesson, my meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. It perfectly correlates with you don't think it thinks you and there is no th there is no it. So that was another moment that just kind of exploded my mind. And uh, I stayed with Est until it kind of you know, I have this theory that organizations start from a, often from uh, uh, principles. Organization cr grows and then uh, it turns into a racket. The principles become secondary to the organization. And at that point, the survival of the organization becomes more important than the original principles it was based on. And when I tried to point that out, I felt like I had just been, you know, when you're in a, a belief system or an organization and you try to say the emperor has no clothes, I was pretty young then and I really thought I could point that out while well, I felt I'd been run over by a steamroller. I left that organization and a few months later I went into a deep depression for about three months. I was sleeping 20 to 22 hours a day everything f looked so black from that level. Lloyd reminded me of that when he said, you know, you have those moments of terror that the Holy Spirit 
uh, brings up to heel or the ego will scare the shit out of you, basically. Anyways, it was bleak. It was dark. It was black. I was sleeping 20 to 22 hours a day, which went by in a blink. I'd be awake for two to four hours every day, which seemed like an eternity of suffering. And uh, this just went on day after day after day till it seems very reasonable suicide seems to be quite reasonable at that point after a while you know i really got to see the distinction of dropping levels of consciousness into nothingness but in a bleak way and i couldn't find one iota of quote self-worth and i just remember thinking i guess i'm just gonna have to check out from this particular pain and suffering and the next moment I was shown this, however you want to put it, vision, insight, that death was not going to be an escape because it was just going to be like the last three months. I'd flash out and I'd be back here in a blink facing the same situation. 22 hours of that 22 hours, it seemed like a blink and that two to four hours when I was awake, was just going to be put me right back in the same situation and it was like this tonnage landed on me that death was not going to be a solution so that kind of got even bleaker for uh, a bit and then i remember i woke up one morning and the voice just said you have a right to be and there was so much love and certainty in that one statement you have a right to be that i just got up out of bed felt brand new and went on with life and i'll always treasure that moment it was just so clear in it's the love and compassion of what i call the voice so i move forward with that um Life went on. Mary and I got unmarried around 29 or 30. I bought a motor home, went on the road with my studies and meditations and contemplations. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. All I knew is I loved to play basketball. So I drove all through the States playing basketball from college to college. Every day I was at a different college playing basketball. And, uh, this went on till I was about 34, 35, working in between. And right around then, I was in Denver, Colorado, and I heard who was known at the time as the master teacher. I think I like to refer to him as the old man at this point. So around 35 or so, I uh, heard him speak, found it very profound. Uh, I was in a partnership in business with a, a woman that we'd worked together for a number of years. And I just came back one day and said, this is all yours. I'm leaving to move up to Wisconsin. So I did. I showed up with a, uh, we had a lot of cash in those days from my business. I showed up at the uh, Endeavor Academy with a $10,000 in a bag and handed it to the uh, accounting department. And said here's my contribution this is everything i have and that started uh the next adventure up there in wisconsin at the denver academy i think when i moved up there there was about 40 of us and i swear by the time i left there was probably around 400 of us around and worldwide and all of that and uh again i wouldn't have traded that experience for anything it started out with very high ideals, and uh, as time went on, over the next four and a half years or so, it uh, just got kind of weird for me. I think uh, I got tired of asking people for money, for starters, and, <laughs> and there was a moment where I just said, you know, I'm done and I'm full, and uh, given the previous experience with est rather than convince people that i didn't really like where this was going i packed up everything in the middle of the night and uh, took a taxi to the bus station and got on a train went down to chicago ended up back in denver 
uh, which I'm sure was surprising to a lot of people. But when it's over, it's over. And that was over for me. And uh, it was kind of, there was a lot of uh, comedy in the rumors that circulated after I left. Um, some of which, oh, I ran, I had stolen a lot of money and I ran off from Endeavor Academy. That was another, that was a good movie. That one was. Another one was I was living with Chucky in Madison. Chucky, a good gay friend of mine. He and I were living together as lovers. That was also an excellent story. And uh, <laughs> it really helps when you realize you're not your history or other projections, uh, opinions of you. There's a certain degree of freedom in there. I remember for the next six months after I left Endeavor, I felt like I was levitating wherever I moved. It was the most remarkable experience. I felt like I was like so light and so expanded. And uh, yeah, so that was quite real for about six months or so. So that puts me probably around 40-ish. Went back out in the world, started my business up again. Around 45, I met my lovely wife, Lynn, who is on the Zoom call next to me. And uh, Lynn comes from a very Christian background. She's very well versed in scripture and the Bible, which as you heard, I'm not. And so for the first five or six years, it was an incredible lesson. I think that Jesus says, you know, words are just symbols of symbols. Don't let them get in the way of your joining. It became an incredible lesson to learn each other's language. I had coarse language. I had other language. Lenny had scriptural language. And we spent hours and hours translating each other's heart to discover we were saying the same thing, just using different words. And that showed up so many times. And it wasn't easy in the beginning because it's very easy to get positional about your understandings and awarenesses and, and uh, observations. She's the oldest in her family. I'm the oldest in my family. We're used to being right a lot. We're both very strong-willed people. And one of the things the Holy Spirit really gave to us has been a huge gift is uh, asking for another way. And we called it the third way. So if she had a strong opinion about something, it could be as simple as what piece of furniture should go in our next house. And I had a strong opinion about what piece of furniture should not go in the next house. It was always a moment of willfulness you might say and then we started learning how to whoever could remember to ask for a third way before we went crazy. yeah before we got too crazy with the particular uh, uh positionality i would say whoever could ask for the third way first the other we would both just surrender that and we would always be given a better solution than either one of us had in the moment. And you start to really learn to trust that over time. And I mean, we would get outraged with each other sometimes. And then one of us would have a moment of sanity, ask for a third way. We just step back, even though our body and adrenaline and anger and emotions were going off, we would just sit and wait for it to come in. And it would always come in. And it has been such a blessing over the years to constantly ask for another way using the course's terminology. And uh, so that's unfolded. And then I would say, so we've been married now 20 years. About eight or nine years ago, we were shown this little idea called the most benevolent outcome. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It comes from a book called The Gentle Way. And uh, it was just describing how in any situation and circumstance, you can ask the Holy Spirit for a most benevolent outcome. So that seemed like an interesting idea that the terminology was felt good to me. I, you know, it was, I request the most benevolent outcome regarding this situation, fill in the blank. 
uh, beyond my greatest hopes and expectations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So it had gratitude in there, it felt good. But it was still an interesting idea. But we're driving down the Oregon coast eight or nine years ago. We'd been there the year before. It was beautiful. It was sunny. We loved it. Couldn't wait to get back there. And this time it was not that. It was foggy. Linnet, we'd wanted to see the whales coming down the coast. I wanted sunshine. I love sunshine. It was foggy. It was rainy. We went to this restaurant that was on the ocean that talked about whales. We said, are there any whales around here? The guy laughed at us. He said, look at that window there. You can't even see out the window. How the hell are you gonna see whales? Not only that, the whales came by here three months ago. You're in completely the wrong time of the season. So that was a moment. So we're driving down the Oregon coast and I haven't seen any sun for since we got there. And I said, Lenny, you know what? This seems like a good time to try a most benevolent outcome. And you demanded it. I did, I said. I request a most benevolent outcome for sunshine for the rest of our trip beyond my greatest hopes and expectations. Holy Spirit, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Lenny said to me, oh yeah? Well, I request a most benevolent outcome to see some whales beyond my greatest hopes and expectations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I swear, 15 minutes later, I come around to Ben, it's pure sunshine. I never stop for the rest of the trip. Okay, that's nice. Could be a coincidence. Who cares? So we keep on going for about a half an hour. Lynn's got a potty. We see this little park sign and we pull over to the park. There's a, some uh, bathrooms there. It's up on the cliff, up on the bluffs by the ocean. I pull in this limb. This woman comes running over and says, have you seen the whales? Have you seen the whales? No. So we go out on the edge of the bluff. There's like this pod of whales, three whales with three young little whales. They probably have a name, but little baby whales. And they are literally, for the next hour we're there, they're doing a whale ballet out in the bay. And it's like, wow, this is, we, we just like, we're filled with gratitude. It struck us so deeply that all you have to do is ask the Holy Spirit for a benevolent outcome in all situations and circumstances. And that has just continued for us today. You know, one of the things that we really have learned to give up, I think the Course has a quote that says, would you rather be right or happy? And that's pretty simple and I like that. But one of the things I noticed for myself was there's a little nuance in there for me, which is, would you rather get it right or would you rather be happy? Because when you, whatever you're doing each day, you kind of have your own plan in the situation. Rarely does it go the way you think it should go. And my wife and I have been business partners for 20 years. So she also has her own plan in the day. And then we're both got these plans and blah, blah, blah. And the willingness to not get it right the first time has given us so much space. We call ourselves the recovers because I am willing to not get it right. But I am so excited about asking the Holy Spirit for a most benevolent outcome for a solution beyond my greatest hopes and expectations. And there's a degree of freedom in that, not going through the world trying to always get it right, that has been so nurturing for both of us. So no matter what happens, things can go sideways all day long. It just becomes another opportunity to ask the Holy Spirit for a most benevolent outcome and a solution beyond our greatest hopes and expectations. And the coolest thing with that one line, beyond my greatest hopes and expectations, it completely frees me from the past of any idea that of my own I need to lay on the present. And each and as this has become realer and realer through uh, many moments of grace, you might say, when I get to that one place beyond my greatest hopes and expectations, a thrill goes through me that's just always the best. And then, thank you, thank you, thank you, because you know it's already taken place because you've turned it over to the Holy Spirit. That I am eternally grateful for, no matter where I find myself. 
So that kind of brings us up to where we are now, I think. And I have, as Lloyd said last week, I could keep telling you about stuff for a very long time, but here we are. If you have any questions, concerns for my state of mind, anything like that, feel free to ask. <laughs> and I love you all. It's such a pleasure to be able to share my experience with you. Thanks, Clive. That was um, pretty amazing. When I, when I listen to your story and I think about my story, I think surely we didn't grow up on the same planet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So has anyone got any questions? I'm, I'm sort of a bit stunned. I'm thinking I had a lot of questions early on because I wanted to ask you about something, but I want, does anyone else have some questions at the moment? Well, I'll ask you, you know, you mentioned when we first came on, like Teddy's been a table turner for you. So... Can you talk a bit about that maybe? What sort of tables has he turned over for you? Does that make sense? Well, it does. I will say that he hasn't really been a table turner for me except one time. But I watch him turning tables in other people's experience. And I don't know if I got this term from the disappearance of the universe, but that, you know, it's always Jeff. T Teddy is like the king of Jaffo, J-A-F-O, just another forgiveness opportunity because he will shake it, baby. He's like the Donald Trump of A Course in Miracles to me. <laughs> he comes out every day and freaking beats this carpet and all this stuff falls out. And then you get to forgive it all. And just like with Donald Trump, he's in the White House. He comes every day and he beats the carpet and all this shit comes out and everybody makes it mean everything. But really, you just have an opportunity to forgive all the stuff that came out of the carpet. And uh, when I refer to Teddy as a table turner, he has such an amazingly high commitment to the purity of the Course in Miracles that when he doesn't experience the people holding it at that level he turns tables bless his heart i love him for that i don't like it when it's directed at me because then i really have to get down with forgiveness but that's just me you know i remember uh we were <laughs> here's telling one on myself i remember a, a couple of years ago i hadn't seen him for a long time we got together we were hanging out we were uh snorting cocaine one night together and uh, we were telling stories, we, and all of a sudden, he stands up and he gets in my face about what's my purpose, what's your purpose, what's your, it can be any per, and I'm just like a freaking deer in the headlights going, up to that point, it was, I had thought I was pretty clear my purpose was to forgive the world, love my brother, release the Christ in everyone, that was just like, as all I do. That's what I continue to do. People show up in my awareness. It's a wonderful thing. But when you have Teddy the Table Turner in your face, very assertively saying, what's your purpose? The whole world goes blank. So, and I remember stumbling out of his, we were in a, in a hotel, a motel, stumbling out of his room a little bit later, wandering down the hall in this dazed and confused moment, going back to my room and sitting down and just asking the Holy Spirit to just be present and show me what I needed to show. And uh, he just, <laughs> he just basically, if I, if I can summarize this, showed me I was doing exactly what my purpose was, that my job, my only function was to forgive the world and love my brother and that Teddy had such a high commitment to that, but in that moment he forgot I was in his mind and that his purpose was my purpose no matter what. And I don't know, I can't remember if it was the next morning or later on that night, he called me and basically said exactly the same thing to me. He has a better memory than me, I have very short-term memory, but it was just, it was just a wonderful moment. But I know, as I say, He's, <laughs> that's the only time I've ever had one of my tables turned. I wanted Teddy's, Teddy turning a table on me, you might say. Does that answer your question, Annie? 
Yeah, it does. And it's, it's really beautiful. It's almost like that illustration too of like there's that moment of doubt and uncertainty. You know, yes. someone plays that part and there's a moment of doubt and uncertainty. Yes. You're questioning yourself sort of. Yes. And you have to sit and sit down and the answer comes, you know, and it's clear and it's like, bam, you know, you're yep. on track. Yeah. Uncertainty is really valuable the more I go along because it, it makes you call each time. That's all. I, that, that's just the truth for me. Like I get in those moments where do I really absolutely know anything? And then I'm reminded that I absolutely know God is real. This isn't. And I'm free in the knowing of that. And that the Holy Spirit just keeps on giving me the experience of that every day in so many different ways. With Lynn and I, work, when Lynn and I work together, we do shows and we can see 20,000 people in a weekend, three days. And when we go into these shows, you know, we ask very clearly for the Holy Spirit to be with us and that may each person, we, we'll spend two to three minutes with a person with our work. We're pitchmen, you know, it slices it dices. Two to three minutes with a person, and uh, we want them leaving knowing that we have joined hearts and that they have light as they leave. That's our commitment. No matter what it seems like we're doing, that's what we're doing. You know, I mean, I was thinking the other day, there's our our wedding song, right, honey, was, was uh, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. And there's one line in What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. It says, I see people shaking hands saying how do you do what they're really saying is i love you and that's our experience with anybody we meet it's just it's the greatest gift in this particular run through i'm so appreciative well but that's, that's funny you mentioned that table turning because i had a little experience of that with teddy the other day now that you say it like that i thought oh yeah that's that's what happened to me i was asking a little question about grateful kevin on the screen over there and Teddy turned it on to me. Now, what because I wasn't expecting it. I was like, I felt like I was, like you said, a deer in the headlights. And, and I felt like I was being hit around the head by a rubber chicken. I'm thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, I, and it sort of it came, went through pretty fast though. And, and I just realized at the end of it, I just thought to myself, well, all, all I've done is ask a question, and all Teddy's done is answer the question. Yes. And that was it. And it's like I made yes. up this whole story to yes. go with it. Like I was maybe being attacked or something yes. was happening here. I think, what's going on here? And it's all this stuff was going on. And really, simply, I asked a question, Teddy answered me, end of story. That was it. Yes. So. It's really that clear, too. It's so amazing. You know, By Byron Crady has this great little question, how would I feel if I didn't believe this story? And you just ask yourself that, and it's just always that. The upset is always coming from some past-based story that kicks in so rapidly and that's, you know, I, I was laughing the other day. It's like the, the uh, little ego has three basic tools. It has fear, it has FU, which is resentment and anger, and it has forgetfulness. And that's really all it's really got in its toolbox. Fear, FU, and forgetfulness. So the fear and the FU seems to be completely taken care of my job is to remember and choose, remember and choose, remember and choose. And the stories come up and it's just like, oh, thanks. So it really doesn't matter what comes up, what, what particular reflection expresses during my day. My job is to remember and choose love, most benevolent outcome. It gets really, I call it the uh, uh, serenity of simplicity over the calamity of complexity and that's my choice i'm a pretty simple guy as you probably have figured out so clive i've got a couple of questions or one question <clears throat> when you're at the academy there must have been some pretty amazing moments there for you could you any, any got any good stories or just some sort of a something that you happened there that <laughs> <laughs> that's a good <laughs> that's was... great great stuff okay so here's the thing my whole life, I've been very empathic. So I love energy. I love massive amounts of energy. I love Kundalini energy. I used to love being around Buddhist monks that had meditated for 40 years because they had a particular field around them. And I could just sit in there and bathe in this, what I call congruent energy around them. 
And so when I met the master teacher, as anybody that might have met him knows, he just generates a massive amount of energy. And man, when that when I felt that, I just thought, oh, this is the best thing in the whole world, right? And so that's kind of what the addiction was, if you will, was I love being around that energy. All the rest of it was just sort of the stuff I did or did slash put up with just so I could enjoy the energy. Um, I'd already had enough kind of guru experiences that I didn't really feel. I know there was a, you know, like with any particular leader slash cult leader, the hierarchy gets pretty firmly established. So everybody's kind of fighting for their place around the source of that, the leader. Uh, I didn't really care too much about that. I did really like being around the energy whenever it showed up. And, uh, but my personal experience, I mean, funny things would happen. Like I had a friend there, Eric, he was a great, you might know Eric Gatehouse. He was a great ping pong player in Australia. And I loved the game. I was pretty good at it. He and I used to play two or three times uh, a week uh, for a couple hours at the academy. And one time we did it right after a session, we went down there and we played full out. I mean, we were so, we were very good and so equal that we could have rallies that would just take us out. Well, one time we were down there playing and Gloria came down and a couple other um, of her friends, I forget some of their names, but it was four women came down and we were releasing so much energy in this ping pong game that within about five minutes, all four of them were passed out on the floor. And <laughs> that's a fun memory. It's like, wow, these are really crummy cheerleaders. Okay. <laughs> they just went down hard. <laughs> so my personal experience was about every like being in that energy i would i felt like i was getting blown up like a balloon it was so i'd get fuller and fuller and fuller and it was just ecstatic and you'd walk around i'd feel like a giant erection some days it was so full and then but i could only hold so much and then the balloon would just go and it would collapse and it was quite disheartening would be a word until it built up again over the next few days. But uh, you know that eh, 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 over four and a half years, at some point you just go, oh, I guess I'm done with this. It was fun while it lasted. So that was another piece of that puzzle. So there's an answer for you, Kevin. Thanks, Clive. Anyone else have any questions? Or want to make a comment at all? Clive, did you say um, your wife's there with you, Lynn, is it? Yes. Anything she wants to say or ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, she's heard it all before, Kevin. So she probably has. Do you have anything to say, honey? Hi, Kevin. <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. She's over there grooving. I think she had some of your cookie, Teddy. Yeah. <laughs> so she's really good. Believe me. Okay. <laughs> You got the, you know, it's Girl Scout cookie season. You got them all beat to hell. Hello. Hey. <clears throat> uh, seeing as no one, well, I'm assuming there's no questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you something, but it's, it's all about me, actually. Um, but it was a bit <laughs> triggered by something. Of course, it is about me, but triggered by something you said. Yes. Um. So I had an interesting day yesterday and was once again asking to just hear the voice of Jesus, you know, just guiding me in the minutia, even what, do, what would you have me do? What do I need to do? Where would you have me go? And that was great in the morning. And then I had nothing to do in the afternoon. And I was like, what, what do I do? And it, and the guy, well, all I got was just do what, do what you want, enjoy yourself, you know? And a friend of mine said, do you want to come over to a mate's place to having some drinks? And I said, and I was like, what do I do? And he's like, go oh, enjoy yourself. So I'm like, rightio. Went along, had a few drinks, enjoyed myself. Woke up this morning feeling guilty as sin. Um, and then just your comment about taking cocaine. Oh, and I feel a bit of emotion. And then, and then about, so I've never, I have massive guilt about it. 
when I think about the last two relationships I've had, the men have been really big drinkers and have been the reason why I've said goodbye to them. Um, and then, but it feels like it's a real repeating pattern. And so I feel, I realize I've got some forgiveness to do with that. And I just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anyone has any, you know, the world tells us, oh, I don't know, just never really. And I know, you know, I understand it. The, you know, this morning in my practice, my lesson sort of, which was, you know, my, 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 only, my, my thoughts, I only, I only think my thoughts with God, you know, taking that step back from the ego projection and guilt, but I'd just love to hear, and I could feel that, I can feel it's a projection, um, but I just thought I'd put it out there and see if anyone has any thoughts, ideas. Yeah, thank you. I got an idea. Be kind to yourself. <laughs> I will tell you, one of the things I've really been seeing so... What's your first name? Uh, Sarah. 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 Hello, Hello, Sarah. Clive here. Um, uh, You know, that whole idea, like, love your neighbor like yourself. I watch so many people. I don't care what community they're in. Christian community, course community. They're trying so hard to love other people. And I watch how unkind they are to themselves. And it just touches me so much, you know, it's, there's a level of kindness that's available right now more than ever before. The benevolence that is, you know, like you could say this, there's a time lock that's been released and there's a benevolence that's available like never before. And you can give that benevolence to that little childlike self that wants to know that no matter what, it is okay. No matter what emotion it's having, no matter what confusion it's having, that you, you, the heart that you are, is there for that. And the heart that you are has so much kindness to give to yourself. We kind of get distracted in trying to give it to our outside projections, people, family members. We forget all about that little five-year-old inside that just wants to know it's going to be okay. I had a friend say one time, and it made so much sense to me, if you're trying to dictate your spirituality to yourself in a language that a five-year-old can't hear, you're getting way too confusing. So if you could be kind enough to yourself to just say, when I, you know, when I get reactivated sometimes, as simple as it sounds, I'll just say, you know what? It's okay. I'm here. I love you. It's okay. I'm here. I love you. It just seems to create a lot of space, you know? Uh, it, it, because... The will of your heart is to be open and extend, but we get contracted sometimes with these emotions, you know, and Teddy and I doing cocaine is, is just a nothing thing. I want you to know that Sarah, because we don't really give it any meaning. It's not different than having soda water. You know what I mean? So just to put that context around it. And thirdly, is there one other thing in there? Gentleness, kindness. Anything you think of, honey, that I didn't say? But that's what, oh, that's what I wanted to say. You reminded me when you're talking about fellas, right? I saw this wonderful cartoon the other day. She was saying, no, it's not you, it's me. I just really make bad choices in men. (laughs) And that really tickled me. It's like, oh, okay. So sometimes I make bad choices. But the, the, the opportunity, like I was saying earlier about recovery, is like, Oh, okay, that didn't work so good. Holy Spirit, I request the most benevolent outcome for expanding my choices in friends and men, however that might be real for you. (laughs) Holy Spirit gives everything to everybody. You just got to ask. Oh, yeah, here's so my wife just reminded me of something. This is a perfect example of recovery. So we have a couple of friends. good Christian friends, very Republican. We have great conversations with them. But besides the point, Steve has a truck he's had for, 
I don't know, 15, how many years? 10 years. He's got a truck. It's 10 years old. He decides he's sick of this truck. There's stuff that doesn't work on it. It's blah, blah, blah. It needs repairs. He's going to sell this truck. Well, this guy knocks on his door the next day and says, can I buy your truck? Steve is so excited here out of the blue. A guy wants to buy his truck. So he sells it to the guy for $5,000. He goes out to buy a new truck. He cannot believe that trucks are forty dollars and $50,000 now since he's had this truck. He's so disillusioned that he, to get a used truck like the one he had was going to cost him $25,000. He can't believe it. This is a terrible thing. But I said, Steve, we got my wife and I've always talked to them about most benevolent outcomes, just asking the Holy Spirit for. I said, do a most benevolent outcome for the truck. You'll get a beautiful truck. So a few days later, he and his wife are looking on Auto Trader for trucks. She sees this truck. She says, Steve, that's your truck. He says, oh, my God, it is. So they call up the guy that had bought the truck. He was going through a divorce. He'd fixed up the whole truck. It was in perfect running condition. And he bought the truck back for $7,000. And he's so excited that he... He feels like he won the lottery just doing a most benevolent outcome. The Holy Spirit orchestrated this whole amazing thing. Let's say he didn't get it. He blew it the first time, he thinks, but it, he recovered beautifully. Everything is an opportunity for recovery when you remember to ask the Holy Spirit. That's what I can tell you. So. Yeah. Go ahead. Sarah, hello, Clive. So nice Clive. to hear everything, Clive. Everything. <laughs> 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 and thanks for highlighting kindness and benevolence. That's so great. And thanks for telling her about us doing cocaine. Ah, uh, you know. <laughs> That's a big secret. <laughs> I wanted to take some of the pressure off you, Teddy, okay? <laughs> it's, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we should Nikki. cross table sometimes. <laughs> but, Sarah, I wanted to mention to you, when I get a message to be to enjoy, that's a big message. To enjoy yourself is everything. It's total forgiveness. It's total fulfillment of purpose. And all it means is don't judge anything. It's like follow the, the, your heart, the prompts that come to you in your heart. Visit your friends, have a drink, have an ice cream. <laughs> follow the prompts and enjoy it. It just means enjoy is one of the greatest directives we can have here in time. So I just wanted to mention that that's not just a by the way, that's a full <laughs> on fulfillment. Enjoy that's it. A, yes. Nice, Vicki. That's great. Thanks. Really great. You know, I really, I, I say this just about every meeting. You know, when we read the course, I mean, the purpose of the course is to find the blocks to the awareness of love's presence so that we can forgive them in ourselves. So all that happened is, you know, you found something and it's purposeful. It's for the purpose of you forgiving yourself so that you can go back to being, you know, freer or more joyful or find out what gets in the way of the joy. But it's not because you're a sinner. It's not because God hates you. It's not, we, we, we only get the result of our own thinking. So we punish ourselves. You know, God's not waiting. He's not, you know. Teddy's gone. Oh, okay. He must have the So, and, and that's something people really re need to remember because otherwise <laughs> we think we've done something wrong. And that's wrong oh, to have done so something right wrong. When the truth is, we're <laughs> supposed like to find everything. the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is what we are and learn how to forgive them, to no, let them go. Hear very well with Vicky's talking in the background. Oh, she's gone. Oh, still coming through quite a lot. Okay. My son called. Can I add a piece of that, Teddy? Is that a yes? You're on mute. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's where I really have so much inspiration about the recovery because when I watch the mind's dynamic, it's not the first move. Like, you, okay, you have a grievance or you have a reaction or you have a judgment, right? That's the revealing of what needs to be forgiven. I, but I watched the person 
do the second move, which is attack themselves for having that. And it's the second move that just kicks their ass. It's like you're so far gone at that point, you can hardly find your way back until things relax a little bit. Yeah. You know, my wife calls it going down the rabbit hole. And, you know, I always have this favorite story. It's like the nun walking down the hall at the, at the a monastery with a tray full of glasses. And she trips and she spills the glasses. And she says, oh, heck, I spilt. Oh, darn, I said, heck. Oh, damn, I said, darn. Oh, shit, I said, damn. Oh, fuck, I said, shit. I didn't want to be a nun anyways. And it's those, that second move that gets you. You feel so guilty about the situation that you attack yourself. And... That's why that idea of being the recoverers, we're not going to get it right the first time, especially when Teddy says, you know, to find those blocks to the awareness of love's presence. That's absolutely accurate. A lot of times it feels like those blocks are finding you, thanks to the orchestration of the Holy Spirit. You don't really have to go looking for them. They just keep coming to you. And it's like, oh, great, thanks. Another opportunity to recover through choosing the Holy Spirit. Like Lloyd said last week, you know, it's like, uh, one choice is a DVD of predestination, which becomes clearer and cleaner and happier and lighter. And or you keep making the ego's choice, which gets heavier, darker and kind of confusing. And it's just as simple as that. That's me. It's gotten really simple because everything is so Looney Tunes that the choice is simple. I cannot solve this on my own, nor do I have to. It's fantastic. You know, when you, after, when I got sick way back then, I was saying when I got 17, when I came out of that, everything felt like a movie to me or sitcoms were big back then. Every part of my life continued to look like a sitcom. So it was really easy not to take it seriously. And, you know, and I laugh a lot because there's so many things to laugh at. I mean, who could have believed the script writer could come up with this latest script? It's just so remarkably funny. And it constantly keeps writing these scripts for things to, for one to believe in the limitations of the world. But it gets so outrageous, all you're left with is laughter and choosing the Holy Spirit's interpretation. That's the fun part. I'm all for it. I root for the Holy Spirit because he roots for me. You, you know, Sarah, what, 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 what Clive. <laughs> I know, that's strange. <laughs> Sorry, Teddy. Very strange. <laughs> what Hermes is talking about is yes. what we've been talking about. The difference when Jesus has the discussion with um, Helen and Bill on whether it's stimulus response or stimulus response, 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 response. SR or SRRRR. And I that's see. what happens. We have something hits us and there's a response. Now, what what, what Clive is saying and what the course is talking about, you stop there and you ask. Otherwise, if you don't, you get a, you have this stimulus, you get a response, there's a response to the response, and a response to the response to the response, and you're so far removed from the original stimulus that you really don't have a chance to get an answer because you don't know what the question is anymore. You don't know what the problem is anymore. So that's just sort of... The, and I, you know, one of the things it's very it's very interesting that you know Jesus wasn't a psychology major in college, um, which which makes me laugh because he knows more about than Helen and Bill when you read what he's talking about. Um, so there's an understanding there of how our mind works, how our heart works, and how we work in relationship to the ego, and how we work in relationship to what, what, what Clive Hermes talk about, the Holy Spirit and asking. And, um, you know, even, and I'm gonna, this is, this is an interesting, you know, I was sober for, I don't know, 27 years and I still don't drink, I haven't had a drink in oh, no, God knows how long. But there was a point in time when I was with somebody and they handed me a joint and I asked, and the voice said, no, you don't do that. Two weeks later, somebody else handed me one and I asked, they said, oh yeah, you could do that now. And it was the same thing with the cocaine. I asked, they said, no, no, you can't do it. And then about a month later, I asked and they said, oh yeah, you could do that now. Who knows? And I found out later on and I haven't 
really done anything in a while. But I found out later on that the truth is I had to find out for myself that I wasn't going to be abandoned for doing drugs. Like that Jesus was still going to be talking to me. I was still going to get guidance and direction. And I wasn't any different as a person or who I was. That's so Jesus funny to say that. Thank you. Because um, this morning I always was like, are you still here? <laughs> like, you know? And at one point it was like, uh, yeah, you know. I'm like, oh, fuck, okay. <laughs> and it was a lesson I had to learn because yeah. I had a lot of guilt around it. You know, can I say something? So when Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he didn't say, except if after that, right? He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, exclamation mark, end of story right there, right? That's it, yeah. period. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. So about uh, uh, last July, I was in, I got this email out of nowhere to fly down to Mexico for a nine-day retreat and smoke toad venom called bufo it's five times stronger than ayahuasca i've never done ayahuasca i've never done plant medicines when this showed up in my email i went okay holy spirit most benevolent outcome for discovering the inspiration behind it. yes it was a total yes three days later i flew down to mexico for nine days usually a person will smoke this and then integrate it for they use it for breaking drug addiction for uh bringing up massive blocks to the awareness of love's presence using my terminology and then uh they'll integrate it for a couple or three months we did it twice a day for nine days straight before you i know before you smoke this stuff these i was with 10 other people you they would ask their guides and medicine people and all of them to come in i would just sit there and ask jesus and the holy spirit to be with me and that i could by grace I live, by grace I am released. And then I just shoot out to the edge of the universe. I'd come back, it was every, people were purging and having every freaking, I mean, if you wanna see exorcisms, this was unbelievable. They were releasing stuff I'd never seen before in my life. I came back every time in uh, gratitude, grace, ecstasy. By the end of this experience, people were going back to read their Bibles they had, some of them had had the Course of Miracles and never opened it up. They were going back to read the Course of Miracles and study it. And it was just like, oh, thanks. Right place, right time, sharing my heart. And I didn't know what was going to come out of it, but I was inspired to go down and have this experience. I didn't, you know, if you don't make it mean anything, right or wrong, then you can be there to give everything that needs to be given. That's the way I see it, you know. And as my wife says, when you go down the rabbit hole, all you find down there is a lot of rabbit shit. So don't forget that, okay? <laughs> don't go down. Don't make that second choice. Oh, there's a story. Thanks, Cl thanks, Clive. Um, anyone else? Cheers. Cheers. Anyone else want to um, have got a question or something they want to? I just got to express my gratitude because. <laughs> You know, I'm sitting here this morning going, you know, like everything gets orchestrated perfectly for everyone. And, you know, just you bringing everything up and exposing all that and bringing up and Teddy, you know, that beautiful story about being shown that you're not abandoned under any circumstance or situation and the voice and the guide still there in everything and the undoing of all the guilt. It's, and Sarah, your question, it's just so real amazing huh yeah it is funny that just one word you know like just one sentence can be enough and you know unfolds a chain right anyone else before we wrap it up it's a good yep. opportunity yep you know? yep yeah um oh i just yeah thank you so much and particularly for that sharing on the drugs um that's still that's a big one for me that's just amazing um 
Yeah, we have so many family members affected by by drugs, um, and uh, I'm just I'm absolutely terrified of them. Um, I have a friend who uh, uses um, I think it's magic mushrooms occasionally, um, and um, yeah, I said to him, I said I couldn't do anything like that. I said I'm just too um, petrified but just to um uh he you know you're saying like yeah look that we're not abandoned that um i'm just seeing how uh wrapped up in in concepts in the things that i've been taught by this world that are that are right and that are wrong that the laws of this world how um yeah how uh bound by them I uh, I can um so yes yeah, so I thank you because that's just a really profound uh example I I remember getting told just before I came to a course in miracles I got told by um a meditation teacher that every single concept we've been taught in this world is wrong and um so this is just another perfect example showing me um yeah how we've really been screwed really yeah so so thank you thank you very much thank you very grateful what's your name dear penelope penelope i'll, I'll share a quick story with you so and it actually comes back around to the course so after i did this experience in mexico uh, a month or two later, my wife and I were down in Mexico at a dentist's office. She was getting her teeth done and I was sitting in the waiting room and there was a 70 year old woman and we just started chatting and out in, we just got on this particular, we were just joined basically, we were joining and we were just sharing our lives and out of nowhere she just said, you know, I had uh, done mushrooms a long time ago and I was freaked out by the trip completely. And a friend came to me and he said, you know, when it gets scary like that, you just have to laugh, just start laughing. And this was after the trip. So she waited a number of years. She was quite, you know, afraid, but she did mushrooms one more time and it got really weird, but she remembered what he'd said about just laughing. And I remember, you know, the great quote from the course, a tiny, tiny mad idea when the son of God forgot to laugh. Okay, great. So she tells me this whole thing. So a month later, um, I'm talking to a friend. He was going to do an ayahuasca trip, but he's really afraid. I, I said, you know what? This lady told me this great story that if it gets kind of hairy, just start laughing really hard. He does this trip. It starts getting really hairy, but he remembered what I said, and he just started laughing his way right out of the craziness. And... That's part of the divine orchestration again. You never know what you're going to be able to pass on as a gift to another that was passed on to you. But it's always available because all of our intent is to join our hearts, no matter what. So I'll tell you that. Can you tell a little story? Thank you. That, that, um, Teddy, like, it's also that asking for help too, like a while just before Teddy came back from California to Boston, he sort of had a moment of wigging out and he reached out and like I had this like this brief moment of almost like going into fear and he was right out there and then miraculously it just I didn't go there and it was just like like you said, Claire, I just kept talking to him and reminding him he's just having a bad trip. And like he's given to me, it'll it's over at some point. You know it's over. You yes. know, nothing happened. You're fine. And even if it goes for a second, maybe it goes for 20 years, but you're fine. You got out of this. Yes, you know? and yes, just yes. Kept, kept talking until it started turning around a bit but it was like you know me not entering in the into the fear yes um yes. with my brother at yes. that moment and um and laughing at it because yes and that's the greatest gift we give to each other is remembering who the other is even when they forget sometimes and we all forget because that's one of the three tools fuck you fear and forgetfulness and to have be surrounded in a community of hearts 
to remember who you are when I forget and vice versa, I'm upside down with that, is so such a huge gift always. Penelope, you know, Penelope, what I want to say too is this. When you were talking, you were saying that it's not bad. It's not good or bad. It's not even real. <laughs> it's not real to be able to judge is the truth of it. Like none of this is real. We can't judge it as good or bad. But like you're saying, the human mind wants to do what's good and avoid what's bad. But both good and bad, when we operate in that realm, is giving the human mind the ability to make a decision about something that's completely useless. What we learn is none of this is real. There is only love. This is not our home. It's never going to be our home. And one day it's not even going to be here to, for us to think about it. Now, that's the difference to me between what the Course teaches and what other new age spirituality things teach. They're trying to teach you how to be, get along in the world, how to do good, how to like make yourself into something. And you're never gonna make yourself into anything here because in the end, it's gone and never existed. Now, that's a little bit different than trying to figure out whether it's good or bad. What Jesus ultimately says is, you got to ask, is this useful or not useful to my purpose? Is this going to help me achieve my purpose or is it not going to help me achieve my purpose? Can I use this? Or if it's, and if it's useful, use it. If it's not, you're going to pass it by because it has no value. And we're looking for things of value so to help us achieve the purpose that we've decided we're here to accomplish that's it and not only that everything under in his hands can be used for our good like what we've made all of it like in our good base everything can be used to be help it can be helpful under his direction anything can be used to forgive to learn what forgiveness is and that can't be bad that's got to be helpful because that well that's true everything's neutral everything's neutral we give it the value that it has and we get the result of the thinking that we use. We give everything all the value it has for us, and we get the result of the value that we've given it. That's why some people give things value that I don't even I don't even think about. And stuff I give value to, they, it's not in their mind at all. It's because we're making up the world as we see it, giving it the value that it has for us, and then utilizing that value either for or against us. When the only value it has is, like Jesus says, to pass it by because it's not so. Yes. That's it. Go your way blessing. What'd you say? Go your way blessing. Go your way blessing. <laughs> Can I, Teddy, I gotta add something to that too, because I don't know, 30 years ago, you were teaching one time and you used a term called escape velocity. And that struck me then, and it has stayed with me. And the kind of the context of it or the analogy of it would be more accurate, was there's so many things in this world that will accelerate you. And it's very easy to get hooked into the acceleration. But if your commitment is getting out of here, so to speak, right? At the end of the world as we know it, then the choice for the Holy Spirit and the retraining of the mind is that which allows for escape velocity. And it, like I said, just because something is speeding you up or accelerating you doesn't mean it has what it needs to apply escape velocity to. That's where the Course in Miracles is so dear to me. That's what I'll say. Trying to escape gravity, you better find the speed that's going to get you out of gravity. That's really beautiful. It's like meeting you where you are. Like I was talking about recently about it's almost like someone comes along, they're trying to um, lift you out completely, but it's much better for you, for them to meet you there and lift you up to the next rung because that's where you can yeah. move yeah. from. 
and it's more yeah. helpful rather than you get trying to lift it out and then you crash and burn and it takes you yeah. another yeah. 500 years to get back to that rung you were on before. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that completely. That's when I, uh, in the in the Aquarian Gospel, it said Jesus grew from grace to grace. That's the kind of comparison I have to what you're saying, Annie. It's we grow through grace by grace by grace. And it's a beautifully orchestrated organic growth, if you will. And I'm forever grateful. Okay, anyone else? Um, I don't know how much time Clive's got, but anyone else got something they want to ask or comment on? Chantal, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say hi. It's the first time I'm on here and uh, it's just been really joyful to hear everybody's input and the reminders about the course and yeah so thank you everyone thank you i just wanted to say thank you clive it's been really nice to hear your story and know you a little bit and oh thanks everyone and i actually have to go but i really appreciate this forum what is your what is your name allison allison have we met before allison you are so familiar to me i don't know okay um, enough hello friend yeah hi <laughs> But, but Hermes, yeah, but Hermes, Hermes had left before I yeah. came along. Yeah, I think and, so. And only your legend preceded you. <laughs> <laughs> Which legend? As I said, I have ended up with many legends being told about me. <laughs> I, only Teddy's best girlfriend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the one. That gets, I think Eric puts that on Facebook once a year. We look like the gayest couple ever, don't we? <laughs> My wife says, not that again. <laughs> I was telling him he had to wear his best frock for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks, everyone. I'm off. Thank you, Allison. Cheers. Okay, so that's it. Everyone done? Yeah, thank you so much, though, um, Clermies. I just can't call you anything. <laughs> you have to make up a... <laughs> I'll call you, no, you can, no, no, your last name. Nothing. Everybody can. Point. I love. I love the name Hermes. I just want <laughs> you to know. I. It's so <laughs> endearing to me. It's got so much, just wonderfulness attached to it. I laughed when you first wrote me and called me Clermes. It's to me, it sounded like a se sexually transmitted disease. Someone else okay. said that to me yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Good. We're on the same track there, Kevin. <laughs> so Hermes or Clive. I mean, even with Teddy, I, I had to really practice not calling him Hector, but it's natural now. But Hermes will never be a problem. Just a nothing. What, what's a problem? It's a wonderful thing. Clermes will never be a problem, just so you know, Annie. <laughs> uh, so. And I, I wanted to thank you so much. I thank you for the invitation. This has been very dear to me to be able to just share myself. Thank you so much. And Jim was in in before, but he was having technical, amazing was in before, and but he was having technical problems. So, and, but he was really enjoying it. And I'll just send him the recording. So thanks. Was that, was that Jim amazing? Yeah, amazing. amazing? Yeah. Oh, okay. I saw him flash up for a moment. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, thanks again, Clive, and thanks everyone for coming. That was um, very enjoyable. I'll be listening to this one again, that's for sure. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, some beautiful words there, Clive. Some of the things you come out with, it's like, I think we're all going to listen to this one again because it's like there's a few things that you said in there about the way you deal with things and what you do. It's just wonderful. Yeah, thank you. They're simple. That's what I love about them. They've been given to me in simplicity, and I so appreciate them. Did Mark tell you you were an angel too when you went and stayed at Fraser Park? <laughs> no, Mark's greatest line is, let's see if I can say this right. I, I used to think you guys were really cool, but you are so not cool. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get, was that close, Teddy? Was that close? Yeah. One of That's my favorite lines all time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Teddy I got to tell you one more thing with all the stories you shared with me over time uh, you know like your propensity for a magnet for being beaten on physically 
it just astonishes me because my in the orchestration of my life, right? I have never punched a human being. I've never been in a fight. I got punched one time in the most bizarre situation by a guy whose son had run away from home and he started beating on me because I looked like his son. And the weirdest thing was he looked exactly like my dad, right? So it was just like this unbelievable moment. But that's the only time. I, so it's like we keep the balance of the universe intact between not beating and beating. So well done, my friend. Okay. <laughs> He punched me too, Clive, but I knew it, but it was funny because I knew it was going to happen actually before it happened. I went, okay. oh, Mark's going to punch me today. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's so great when nothing means anything, isn't it? It's like, okay, I guess today I get punched. Hey, okay. <laughs> That's great, Annie. That's great. Uh Hey, Vicky, I want to tell you, I so want to make a trip out to Boston and hang out with you guys. So that's, I see that in our future. Um, yeah, hey, any time, Hermes, any of you, as long as we're here, who knows? <laughs> yes. we're here today. Sarah, did um, you say something? Yeah, before you go, before we finish, could you just um, repeat your... Um, most benevolent most outcome? Benevolent, yeah, that one. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we have cards printed now because we have so many people ask us about that. So if you want to write it down, it's it's basically Holy Spirit. I request the most benevolent outcome regarding fill in the blank. Doesn't matter any situation, circumstance. Beyond my greatest hopes and expectations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's just, it's simple. You want to speak it out loud. It seems weird, but it seems to have, you know, I, I, I read so many people that talk about it now. They say, boy, this has the quote law of attraction beaten hands down. I, I've heard it so many times that I call it the flaw of attraction because <laughs> people get so caught up in that shit. It cracks me up when they could just, you know, call on me and all things is really true for me. So there was one other piece I was going to put in there. Oh, and so just recently, Sarah, I discovered that I could really expand these most benevolent outcomes. So every morning I start my day, Lloyd was saying about, you know, how it's great just to kind of set your day in the morning and set your night before you go to bed. And I find that really to be true. And, uh, but I really was shown that in these most benevolent outcomes. So I set my mornings with, Holy Spirit, I request a most benevolent outcome that with every breath I take today, may all of humanity be inspired to make the most benevolent choices for the freedom and liberation of all minds. Holy Spirit, I request the most benevolent outcome that with every sip of liquid I enjoy today, may all of humanity be bathed in the river of life and have access to fresh water beyond my greatest hopes and expectations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the third one is, Holy Spirit, I request the most benevolent outcome that with every bite of nourishment I ingest today, may all of humanity be nourished physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually beyond my greatest hopes and expectations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From my heart to your heart. Thank you, Clive. That seems like a perfect place to wrap it up. Yeah, it's Thanks, really Helen. beautiful. You basically just, we've been listening to Helen's notes and you have basically just summed up all the last few weeks, what we've been doing in a couple of little prayers, the rules for decision and calling on the Holy Spirit in all our decisions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for underlining that, Annie. Yeah, you've you just reduced the course, Jesus, 5,000 words to you know, like not even one page. Good for you. He's shortening time. <laughs> You're the very cool <laughs> God is, this isn't, be free. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love you all. Until next time. Thanks, Clive. Bye-bye.